It is now my pleasure to introduce Lynn Crawford, story writer, Ulubo scholar and practitioner, art critic. She's author of several novels and story collections which include Solo, Low, Simply Separate People, Fortification and Resort, Holiday, and most recently, Simply Separate People 2, published by Brooklyn Rail, Black Square Edition. She's also the recipient of the 2010 Kresge Artist Fellowship and a founding member of MOCAD. Last century, when I blurb Lynn's first book, Solo, I wrote, like 14 white capsules on a tray, these stories are simply yet frighteningly there. Will they induce visions? Will they poison? Beneath their dissembling simplicity and antiseptic diction, a perverse imp agitates the language. From contraption to contraction, solo gestures and withholds with the precision of human desire. In these end of century narratives, where description evacuates plot and humor lines sex, Crawford traces the unsayable while returning to the infinite possibilities of the IU sentence. From the vantage point of 12 years into the 21st century, and so many publications later, I still feel that Lynn is rescuing the moribund, a quite dead novelistic genre, depending on your reading glasses, by that perverse imp which runs over the words ever so lightly towards an angle we've yet to name, biting critique, satire, dystopia, a dreamscape, open wide and swallow, you'll know soon. Please welcome the super talented Lynn Crawford. Thank you so much. Um, I've always loved covers, um, songs, and I think uh, it's fascinating to me how when you hear someone like Johnny Cash do a cover of a song, you really listen to the song differently and you realize that part of doing a cover is embracing the weaknesses of the original song as well as the, as the strengths. And I'm, I'm always fascinated by that kind of interaction. So I feel like what I'm reading today is a cover of Ernest Hemingway's novel, The Sun Also Rises, which um, was set in, uh, it's, set in, it's set in Paris and there's this group of expats which who sort of hang out there and then they wind up going to a bullfight and the two protagonists are Jake Barnes who's a soldier and a reporter who was injured in the war and Lady Brett Ashley and this tribe you know drinks a lot and I think somebody coined them um, the lost generation that was the first time that phrase was was used so in my cover um, it's modern times Jake is a reporter uh, of war crimes and he's mentally injured, not physically injured. And um, this group of entitled young people uh, go to a yoga convention rather than a whole fight. <laughs> and the, uh, the line I open this uh, first part with, uh, which is called Harvest, is the retitle, is uh, by Michael Fronte. I am not a jerk, although sometimes I act like one. <laughs> And the one thing that really strikes me, I just want to say about Hemingway's writing, is it's just a beat and a half from being off. And, it, and it's just, there's this kind of cumbersome quality to it that, that saves itself into, into lyricism, but then it goes back to this cumbersome thing. So I had a lot of fun trying to kind of play with it. It was also horrifying to me because I, I pay so much attention to rhythm, so some of the clunkiness is, uh, the, is the cover. Jake walks into the bar soon after getting a cavity filled that had been lingering for weeks. I'd been on him to get it fixed. Jake gets involved in things he's doing and forgets to take care of himself. He's better at taking care of others. Tonight, I am out with graduate students and staff on my overseas university exchange program. Jake likes my friends. He and his group are older, kinder, more confident, less attached to formal education. Being overseas is nothing new to my friends who proudly recount experiences they've had with the world. Just now I hear Bo, completing his fourth master's degree, say to Gunth, a photographer in the journalism program, I'm not in this country's university to please my parents or further my career. I'm here to learn from the people. Bo follows a sparse diet. One stein of beer gets him high. Now he's tipsy, but tomorrow morning he will be up early 
doing nostril cleansing yeah. exercises and sipping herbal tea. Bo and Gunk sit at the end of our table. We're drinking beer and discussing Hindu mythology, focusing on the beloved figure Ganesh with his human body and elephant head, his taste for sweets, his ability to transcribe. Ganesh is a popular adornment. Several students, Bo, his girlfriend Francis, Gunk, Siri, me, wear his image at least once in a piece of jewelry, tattoo, t-shirt, or toe ring. We discuss Ganesh's origin, what it means that his mother made him from the dirt of her body. It's got to be minstrel blood, Siri, who speaks six languages, says, bobbing her bald head. Ganesh's mother made him out of the dirt of her body. Dirt equals menstruation. Siri has an encyclopedic memory. An image of Ganesh is tattooed on the back of her right wrist. Jake enters the bar and moves to our table with someone who impresses all my program friends, a well-known local businesswoman not connected to the university. She's very pretty. Um, for an American student, socializing with a non-university citizen would be a total score. But Jake isn't in close touch with his parents or connected to the university. He travels regularly but lives in this country, works as a reporter, covers wars, global human rights issues, drug cartels, and genocides. I know this contact with grisly events and so many forms of sadness gets to him, but he rarely admits that it does. Now he stands behind me, kisses my head, puts his hands on my shoulders, introduces his friend to our student crowd. Meet Zigrund, she designed Brett's place, and more recently my dentist's office where I just ran into her. I'm still numb from the drugs they shot in my mouth, he says with slurred speech. I know, like, and respect Sigrund. She's a fine interior designer. She has a beautiful set of teeth and sits down at the table. Jake, hands kneading my shoulders, listens closely to the Ganesh discussion. Watching Siri as she brings up Shiva, Ganesh's supposed father, I totally understand why she shaves her head. Her skull is a beautiful shape, 